Dette er den ukentlige nyhetssendingen fra Europa. Every day they used to be business sitting there for magic potions is trying me friends stealing his wall Well there you go folks that was your extinction report for this week thank you very very much Kevin Hester and uh, that was quite quite good Sean listening back to it I don't know is Sean with me I don't know <laughs> I don't think so but anyway <clears throat> look what we'll do is we had a, a little pre-record yesterday also or no the day before yesterday we had Christopher Busby on and uh, we got some updates on what's going on in Christopher's life and we also got some insight into the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombings and uh, and all things nuclear so I'll just plow on ahead with that and uh, we'll rejoin you again in approximately one hour for the Irish hour and uh, welcome to this week's uh, European Ra um, European News Weekly uh, we're going to be having an interview with uh, Christopher Busby uh, who's put up some articles he's also put up uh, some uh, uh, journal pieces uh, journal uh, reports about various issues um, he's been on before and um, I'd just like to say that he's going to be talking about uh, Fukushima, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, how they all connect um, and basically he's going to explain in fairly clear terms uh, his article that he got on RT, it's an op-ed uh, piece that he did for RT, it came out yesterday and he's uh, very succinctly and clearly broke down the uh, information um, um, and on how all this connects and how there is a kind of a cover-up, if you like to call it that, um, on health uh, sort of effects from radiation uh, sources. So what we have is, uh, at the moment, we have the Japanese government, it's recorded to today, uh, are uh, lifting an evacuation order on the town of Nahar, N Naraha, which is in uh, Fukushima Prefecture. It's heavily contaminated, uh, like other areas that are also going through the same uh, process. Uh, they're trying to move evacuees back into these areas with their children and uh, pregnant women. Um, so basically, uh, Greenpeace came out about a week or so ago. Uh, they were Greenpeace Japan. They were talking about levels of radioactivity in those areas and uh, possible future problems that weren't being taken into account for contamination in uh, mountain and wood areas. So uh, these things have all been talked about, uh, but uh, that's in Japan. And now we're going to go to Chris Busby, who's going to give us a bit of an update on his RT uh, article. And, uh, you know, it's well done for RT for posting this up. Uh, I, I did notice that uh, Russia has uh, lifted uh, sort of uh, fishing restrictions on some uh, Japanese uh, fish. Um, uh, so uh, this is a very interesting development. Um, all right, Chris, welcome to uh, the show. Um, I've got we've got Jimmy Hagen in the background. There is doing the engineering, and he will no doubt be jumping in uh, with this very interesting, I suspect, interview. Hi, Chris. Uh, welcome to the show. Um, yeah. Hello, guys. Hi. Uh, all right. You wanted me to say a few words about Russia today. Well, I, I have been um, um, on the list of correspondents for Russia today since for about two years now, and and uh, I I put in the occasional article on various issues, but this time I was approached by them and said they wanted an opinion piece on Hiroshima it, it, to coincide with the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August the 6th, 1945. <clears throat> and uh, so I said, okay. And then I thought about this and I thought, well, you know, what, I mean, in fact, what they said to me is they wanted the usual thing about connecting connecting the event to the increase in uh, radioactivity in the world and all the other processes that are producing radioactivity but uh, you know right the way through from Chern through Chernobyl to Fukushima but also they wanted me to talk about nuclear war uh, you know beca because of the appalling devastation there had been in, in, in Hiroshima you know to, to, to say well you know we don't want any more of that there's usual stuff Th this is this is now the the subject matter of lots and lots of articles uh, and presentations in all the newspapers and in the media and on the internet. But I thought to myself that actually I wasn't going to do that. I thought what I was going to do was to raise the, 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 the question of Hiroshima not as a, 
some sort of event that you could see in the past as a sort of socio-historic phenomenon that you could weep about and say, oh dear, you know, all these people were killed and wasn't it bad and the United States, you know, is a war crime and all this kind of stuff because that's all old hat. Everybody's been saying that for years. And of course, it's all true. But what I wanted to talk about was the defining moment in the de development of the radiation risk model. Anyone who listens to me or knows what I've done over the last 25 years knows that that's, that's kind of my thing. You know? but, but actually, uh, identifying the beginning of that with, with the Hiroshima process is not something that I've really done very much of. And I thought it was about time to rectify this. So I wrote an article for Russia Today, which anybody can see is up there. Uh, and I, was, I, was, um, I wasn't really sure that they would put, print it, because it didn't seem to me that it was quite what they'd asked for. Uh, and also, it was extremely radical. I mean, it was extremely, um, it was sort of new, but it was really quite savage in its, in its approach to the way in which the world has been bamfoozled by a lot of scientists working for the nuclear industry and for the military over such a long period of time. Uh, using the, 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 the data that, that, that were obtained by a study of the survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing. <clears throat> because <clears throat> that's actually what the entire risk model at the moment is based on. The, the, um, the relationship between radiation dose and cancer, uh, which underpins all of the, um, legal limits which are used to to encourage people back into parts of Fukushima that are still contaminated and and to argue that people weren't affected by the Chernobyl fallout and to argue that people can live near nuclear power stations and that if they develop levels of, of leukemia which are statistically significant it can't be due to the radiation all of these arguments are encapsulated in the current radiation risk model which is now more or less universal in the West um, and this model is based on the on the health effects that were uh, studied in the survivors of the Hiroshima bombing. Now, I've, uh, in the last year or so, in connection with a number of court cases, I've started to look a bit more closely at, the, at this, um, what's called the Lifespan Study, LSS, study of the Hiroshima survivors. And uh, although I knew it was a bit dodgy, having talked to Alice Stewart about it and so on, I mean, I, had, I didn't really realize quite how dodgy it was. And so I, I, I've dished the dirt on this model in the RT article, you know, rather briefly and also, you know, uh, not in a very deeply scientific way, because the people reading those articles are not really scientists and they'd probably get a bit upset if there were too many numbers there. But enough numbers there to show that there was a problem. And the essential problem is this. It is, first of all, that the studies were begun in 1950. So it was like five years after the, um, five years after the bombing. So it was plenty of time for a lot of the people to have died in the meantime between the bombing and the, and the, uh, and the, the recruitment of <coughs> the study group cohorts, study group people. So what they did was they, 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 um, recruited about 110,000 people. To look at to, to look at the health effects of the radiation exposure, and they defined nine groups in terms of how far they were away from from the point where the bomb exploded. The bomb was a, was exploded at a reasonable altitude; it wasn't a ground level burst. And so they could they could do questionnaires and find out how far away from the explosion these people were. And on the basis of physics and calculations and so forth, they could work out what the absorbed dose was. That's the amount, number of joules per kilogram of energy that was absorbed in the bodies of these people. And this concept of absorbed dose more or less began with Hiroshima, because prior to the Second World War, prior to the bomb, uh, absorbed dose didn't exist. It wasn't a concept that anybody used in order to quantify the effects of radiation or the, or the exposure of radiation. It was something that arose after after the uh, the bomb and was associated with the developments of atmospheric testing weapons and all that work that was done in America at places like Hanford and Oak Ridge and so on in the development of nuclear weapons. Um, so what they did was they, associate, they, they then as, tried to associate the dose that they calculated on the basis of the acute external gamma radiation with the groups of people. So you had high dose, then not so high dose, and so on, all the way down to no dose. So, uh, and then they had two groups that were not in the city at the time of the bombing. Now, now, now these ought to have been the groups that represented the controls. But in fact, uh, they found, when they first started looking at the results of, the, of, the, of their early results, they found that 
these groups seemed to be too healthy, and they had a sort of anomalous death rate in different a, different age groups. You know, so it didn't seem to be quite fitting in what they expected. So they abandoned them. So the people who were not exposed to radiation at all, because they weren't there, these people who should have been the, the control group that they they compared to the people who were exposed to radiation to, they abandoned them because they didn't like what the answer was giving them. You see, so they just pushed them to one side. Now the problem, the real problem, is 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 that the is that the the, uh, the the exposures were not only to the gamma radiation from the bomb, they were to the black rain. Because after the bomb exploded, there was a lot of rainfall that occurred all over Hiroshima, particularly towards the west, also in Nagasaki too. So they, they both they both had um, events which involved black rain, which occurred after the bombing. And so it was very heavy rain, and it soaked people right through. And in fact, uh, in the Hiroshima Peace Museum, there are uh, clothes, you know, that were contaminated, by, that were rained on, and that are actually, you know, coloured black, where the rain has fallen on them. And in 1983, Soji Sawada and various colleagues went along and measured it at soil samples from the areas where the black rain had fallen, and found that the black rain contained lots of uranium-234, and also uranium-238. Because after all, we have to remember that these bombs are made of uranium. All bombs are made of uranium. And in fact, if you're talking fallout, most of the fallout is uranium. The, the, the actual quantities in terms of mass of the fallout components that are radioactive, like strontium-90 and cesium, are, t are minute. They're really tiny. Although they're very radioactive, in terms of mass, most of it is uranium. Okay, so what you have is you have a high-dose group and a medium-dose group and a no-dose group and a not-in-city group, and they've, all of them have been contaminated with uranium. Now, we know as a result of work that's been done in the last 15 years following Gulf War, we know that uranium is not something that you can categorize in terms of its health effects or its genotoxicity through the concept of absorbed dose, because it binds to DNA. And so, therefore, the effect that it has is very, very much more targeted, very much greater. And loads of experiments have been done in, in cell cultures in America, in, in laboratories, in mice, in, uh, and, of course, the epidemiology of uranium shows that all of the people exposed to uranium have, sh have, have high levels of cancer and genetic defects in, in their children and chromosome defects. So there have been studied, published studies of uranium miners in Zaire, for instance, uh, uranium workers in France, this of Akanu in, in 2011, uh, then Gulf War veterans' children, uh, then you've got Gulf War veterans themselves with chromosome damages, you've got nuclear test veterans in, in New Zealand that were measured um, uh, by, by Rowlands, and they found increases in uh, chromosome damage and so on. Uh, and so, so there's a huge amount of evidence that uranium is anomalous. And yet the entire fundamental basis of modern risk uh, methodology is based on groups who were like all, you know, the control group and the high-dose group, all exposed to uranium. Now, it's quite reasonable to propose that at least part of, and probably most of, the cancer effects that, that, that continue, that occurred downwind of the of the um, Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki events were caused by uranium and not by the external radiation at all. In which case, the entire structure of, of radiation risk is faulty, which we kind of knew anyway from lots of studies that have been done around nuclear sites and so forth. But this is a reason why it is, because it's actually based on an unsafe foundation. The original epidemiology was 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 faulty. The, the, met, the method that they used was was wrong, and it, and no no sensible epidemiologist would ever use such a method, because quite apart from that, lots and lots of these people just disappeared from the study groups or they died of causes that nobody knew or they married somebody and vanished. So uh, just like a lot of other studies of radiation, the radium studies and the studies of the people in Kazakhstan and all, they're all retrospective studies and so they can't really tell us an awful lot about what's going on. But in this case, it's even worse than that because they were exposed to, you, to, to a substance which causes cancer and which can't be categorized well, in terms of dose. Well, uh, really. So that's I, the problem. I did notice, I did notice in Kazakhstan, for instance, there was uh, basically the issue of uh, uh, the village that kept falling asleep. And then uh, this year they discovered it was radon. And uh, basically what they did then is they've now talked about evacuating the actual village. Um, it's quite interesting that in a country where there's nuclear, uh, is well aware, and there's lots of nuclear uh, orientated doctors and what have you, that nobody could, it took them so long to realize that it was just the radon uh, that this particular village was getting hit by, by a mining, uh, an old mining operation, the uh, pollution from that. Um, and uh, it was, it 
it was sending people to sleep. It was affecting their their uh, uh, nervous system some way. I, I I heard from somebody that it was carbon dioxide. Somebody wanted me to talk about that. I said I didn't know anything about it, so I wasn't going to talk about it. But you oh, say right. it's radon. Well, they said it was radon. Yeah, this year, right. and uh, yeah, right. they were they were discussing it, but for some reason they would never say what it was. Uh, but the thing is, radon, of course, as you know, a big cloud of that can just flush through, um, and it's gone. You know, so unless somebody's got a Geiger counter switched on, uh, or they've got a more importantly a radon specific uh, testing uh, box in their house, uh, you'd never know that that, that that it was there, would you? You know. So. Well, it's the curse of the mummy's tomb, actually. I mean, I I, I, I worked for a while with a guy at the University of Liverpool. A professor there who 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 believed that the reason why Lord Carnarvon and that other guy um, who, who discovered Tutankhamun's tomb, you know, they everybody who went down there died, um, and they said it was the curse of Tutankhamun. He said it was just radon because you know when you if you have something that's like a tomb there that just sits there for like two thousand years and then you break it open and go inside, then the atmosphere is almost pure radon, I think. Um, uh, all right. Okay. So, I mean, while we're talking about this subject, obviously, and we're we're we're, we're talking about even you know the scientists of the day are being surprised by what radiation has to do with health and and its effects, which can be from neurological problems like falling asleep for a week, um, or you know basically as you're talking about getting cancers and there's heart and various other uh, processes could well be involved. So uh, you also brought up uh, uh, in your article about uh, Fukushima, and you were talking specifically about thyroid cancers. Would you like to kind of elaborate? I think you were saying there was 103 at the time uh, 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 thyroid cancers com confirmed, and uh, I believe it's gone up today. Uh, do you have an update for us? Um, yes, I understand it's gone up to 112. But uh, but while, while I'm talking about that, let me just... Um uh, give you an account of the other reason I was fulminating about this business of the of the uh, of the Hiroshima um, lifespan study. It's this that 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 last week to coincide to the with the um, with the 70th anniversary, the Lancet, very prestigious journal, uh, issued a, a whole issue, uh, you know, produced a whole issue with several papers in it written by various scientists and epidemiologists, one of whom was Richard Wakeford. Uh, and, and this was, this was to link as the as the Lancet said, just like I'm trying to do on Russia today, but more elaborately, to link together the the, uh, the occurrence of the this lifespan study, you know, the Hiroshima production of 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 the study that that defines radiation risk and link it right through to Fukushima. Now, in that in that um, report, there is a, a, a table. No, it's a, it's a graph given in a, in in the actual issue in the in the report written partly by Wakeford which shows the excess relative risk for um, thyroid cancer. It's 0.6 per sievert. Now, one sievert is 1,000 millisieverts. Background is about 1 to 2 millisieverts, okay? <clears throat> so you're talking about a 60%. What this says is that from the Hiroshima study, from the lifespan study, uh, we know that 60% increase in thyroid cancer occurs after a dose of 1,000 millisieverts. Right. So in the same issue, another another article is written about Fukushima. And in this article, it says that the the uh, the thyroid dose in the people in Fukushima maximally was 18 millisieverts, but the median the median dose was 0.67 millisieverts. So in other words, they say that the most likely dose to every person, if you take the whole lot of the people who were like in Fukushima prefecture, the most likely thyroid dose is 0.67 millisieverts. The maximum dose is 18 millisieverts. Now you've got these two these two numbers. You've got a 60% increase per thousand millisieverts. This is what the risk model says. And you've got the actual number of millisieverts, because they've measured it, or they've estimated it, and it's 18 millisieverts, top whack, but probably more like 0.67. But let's let's go with 18 millisieverts, okay? You can put the 18 millisieverts, and you can multiply it out by this 60% increase per 1,000 millisieverts, and what you find is that the is that the expected number of thyroid cancers in the, in the 380,000 people that were scanned is about one. That is to say, one extra thyroid cancer in every 10 years in that population. Okay? But actually, we found 103, and you now say 112. Well, on the basis of 103, I mean, the, the excess, incidentally, the excess numbers was were expected as 0.14 or something like that. 
So you can divide the total number excess. You would normally expect 7.6 thyroid cancers in that population in two years. And so with the extra 0.1, you would expect 7.7. .7. But in fact, you've got, you've got 103. So that's 95 too many. And if it's 112, then it's uh, whatever it is. I don't know, 103 times too many. 103 number too many. So in other words, you're talking about a 680 fold, that's like 680 fold mistake in the ICRP risk model. And if we say it's 112 thyroid cancers, that's about a 750 fold excess risk. So in other words, they're not out by a small amount, you know, they're out by like hundreds, 600, 700. And that's approximately the right number that you need to explain the, the childhood leukemia clusters around nuclear sites and also the breast cancer uh, numbers around nuclear sites, which I've just published in this journal, Jacob's Journal of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine. And I've, I've found those excess risks in breast cancer in three different nuclear power stations, or near three different nuclear power stations, and also other places too. So we're talking about an enormously big mistake in, in, in estimating internal radiation risk. Uh, and and uh, this, just... this shows it, this, this, this thyroid cancer excess in Fukushima shows it. Of course they say it's not caused by the radiation in, in another article um, in, the same, in the same issue, you know, because the dose is too low, of course. See, the dose is too low. So rather than looking with our eyes and seeing what's in front of our noses, we say here is a model that was, in, that was figured out in 1952, you know, round about or before the discovery of DNA. We're still using this model, and it tells us what we are seeing is impossible. So therefore, it can't be there. Isn't this mad? Goodness I'm me. Ju I'm just wondering, Chris, is there, is there another way to do the math uh, to uh, maybe maybe the, uh, the calculation of the millisieverts has not been correct? Um, is there a way that you could sort of like run the mathematics so you might get a uh, account for a mistake in the, uh, the millisievert read readings? No, they can't. They, they worked out that the the doses. Well, I mean, you're saying that they got it wrong, and the doses were much bigger. Yeah. I mean, that's possible. That's possible. But it would have had to have been seven hundred times bigger. And if that's the case, they would all be dead. Right. Okay. 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 Interesting. You know, because they're saying eighteen millisieverts. All right. So if they if if that's a mistake, and we have to we have to say let's get let's figure out what dose they would have had to receive on the basis of the risk model. It would be it would be seven hundred times eighteen, wouldn't it? Which is like if you say it's twenty. That's 1,000. That's about one point. What's that? That's about two sieverts. That would have killed them all. They'd be dead. Okay. Uh, all those people, all 380,000, they'd all be dead. Right. So the whole model oh, I mean, is wrong then, basically. Then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I, I mean, the, the way I was looking at it, Chris, is that, that, that their argument that, that, that they fall back on is saying, well, our equipment is so much better than it was. Um, that were, you know, we, we just happened. But I mean, if they did that worldwide and they're using the same equipment, um, and, you know, sh sh and th surely they'll be able to account to say, well, you know, uh, finding a hundred, uh, cancers with the new equipment would, would be, I mean, no, there would be three or four, uh, three, three a year or something. And, and all of a sudden we're seeing, you know, 30 or 40 a year. And we've seen 12. Well, I think, <laughs> actually, I think that's a reasonable argument. I mean, if they come back with that argument, that is a reasonable argument. They could say, well, you know, yeah. normally we don't go out into the streets and look to see everybody who's got thyroid cancer. We only, we, we deter, the, the baseline rate for thyroid cancer just happens to be based on the number of people who end up in hospital and have to be treated. Okay. That's one in a hundred thousand. Anyway. Um, but then, of course, if you go out, you might find a lot of people who've got cancer, that, and then, then it sort of it sort of miraculously regresses, and 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 that's not impossible. That does happen. I mean, when I was on the depleted uranium oversight board, there there had been I was told about well confidentially, but anyway, to hell with it, uh, that they had done some scan studies of people um, with regard to, to kidney cancer, and they had picked up a number of kidney cancers, and they just then rather than you know treating these people, they'd just done nothing, and they'd gone back later and found. That they'd gone. So it does seem as if cancer occurs, little cancers occur in the body all the time, and then they get picked up by the immune system and shot down. So I would think that a proportion of those cases, first of two things, first of all, one, a proportion of those cases could, could well have regressed. So in other words, you know, the fact that there are 112 detected, it's quite possible that, that, that not all of those, you know, would have turned into a full-blown cancer and then been expressed clinically so that they ended up in hospital. But, uh, two, the, 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 it, it seems to me impossible that, um, that more than 50%, if you like, you know, let's, let's put a mark on it. So at least 50% of those must be real, especially since you, 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 you know that in, uh, in, in Chernobyl, similar, a similar occurrence or 
um, there was a similar increase in thyroid cancer, and they didn't have all these sophisticated equipment and all that stuff. These those people just got got the Chernobyl le necklace and had to have their thyroid removed. You know, because they they weren't going around. The Soviets weren't going around giving everybody thyroid tests in the same way as the, as the Japanese are, right? So that's the first thing. Now the second thing is this: is that if that's the case, why don't they do something about it? You know, because it's not difficult for them to to go off with this highly sophisticated equipment and then just scan a load of random people in, in a different prefecture miles away from any iodine, you know, right down in the south, and see how many thyroid cancers they pick up like that in 0 to 18 year olds. I mean, I would have thought that was the first thing that you did. If you're going to come out with all this bullshit about how, you know, it's just the way in which you're scanning, then you have to do that experiment, which I think is what you were suggesting. Yeah, and of course, you know, it was I, I, for the first two years after Fukushima, I was paying close attention to the Japan Thyroid Association, and, and they did not do one study on thyroid. And I have to say, you know, they did a study on mobile phone, they did a study on, uh, I don't know, vaccines or something, but they, they didn't do a study on thyroids, at least for the first two years. Um, so we know that the studies aren't being, uh, the research money isn't being put up, the studies aren't being done. We also know that scientists in Japan, you know, uh, like the geneticist scientists, were, were stopped from getting blood tests that can confirm uh, excuse me, could confirm uh, uh, sort of damage to the blood cells via, via radiation. It was only valid up for three years. Um, and Abe actually st stood in and said that he wouldn't allow it. Um, and so what we're seeing is we're seeing complete uh, blocking of, of, of these studies. Uh, so I, talking I think about it's that, probably this... worse. I think it's probably worse than that, Sean. I think yeah. it's almost certain they have done this um, oh. because because what they would have because you know the thing is that 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 this is like a political issue. So you find you find an enormous increase in thyroid cancer. Okay, I mean, and you want to deny that that thyroid cancer is caused by the radiation, and your only possible exit route is to say that it's a, it's it's an artifact of the fact that you're scanning an awful lot of people. Okay, I mean, given the amount of money that's riding on this, the first thing you would do is you would go and do the, the do the experiment that I'm talking about is, is you would say we know that this is the case because we have studied a lot of people in Timbuktu with the same equipment and found that actually you know there are a whole load of thyroid cancers that nobody knows anything about in Timbuktu so therefore this is an artifact of the methodology right they would have obviously have done that and obviously they have done that but they haven't found what they're looking for that's the point right or they, or they found a very high, high amounts, and uh, it, it was uh, shining a, an issue on pollution. You know, they have to get far enough away from where the fallout dropped. You know. Well, I know, no, they can't do that because this is a specific radioiodine issue. You know. Yeah. We know, we know what causes this. It's, it's iodine one three one. And so the point is that if you go somewhere where there isn't any iodine one three one, and goodness me, you can do that. There, there's, there are various islands to the south of, of Japan or or to the north of Japan, you know, where you can study people who, who've never been near iodine one three one, and you can see how many of them have got thyroid cancer. Okay, it's not difficult, and presumably they've done it because it's not even very expensive to do. Given that you've got all these, given that you have actually gone out and measured 380,000 people, now that's not going to be a cheap operation, right? I mean, what's the problem with going out and measuring another 1,000 in order to get a statistical sample of people, uh, you know, in terms of, of, of whether they've got thyroid cancer or thyroid nodules or whatever, and they haven't been exposed to radioiodine? Most people in Japan probably have been. Uh, well, could be, but then they could go to, I mean, those islands to the south don't have nuclear power stations on them, they could yeah. do that. And and, uh, and also, uh, radio iodine actually, you know, it has quite a short half-life, so... So it's, it's 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 not as if it's like weapons fall out where you know the rate where the strontium ninety and the uranium and all that plutonium is everywhere. In fact, radioiodine is not everywhere, you know, because of its short half life. It just isn't everywhere. So you can easily find some population that doesn't have any at all in them. Right. Okay. Or negligible amounts. Yeah. No, it's uh, so that's interesting. And all right, so we're talking about studies not being done. And um, now, of course, you, you were actually, uh, uh, I think, involved in 2011. Um, I heard that you were running away from some uh, a committee member, and he was trying to get a microphone off you at uh, a melody. Well, yeah, no, that, that, that's right. <clears throat> oh, yeah, this is about you know, this is a little bit of um, this is a story which is quite positive, in fact, you know, amongst all this doom and gloom, um, because. 
There's a big, uh, in, not, in, t in 2011, there was developed an, a, a big group, or, or rather like a group of scientists who are concerned, epidemiologists and anybody, actually, and even politicians, you know, it was, it was set up as a group to consider the effects of low-level radiation. It was called Melody, uh, and the first meeting was in Paris at the University of Paris Sud, which is like a sort of cosmopolitan university. Everybody, people all over the world go there. It's quite a modern place down in the south. So I, I went there. I was I, I was invited to go there by that guy Wolfgang Weiss, who's now head of something or another, WHO or IAEA or something. Um, because I, I had a moan at him, but I said that nobody radical ever goes to these things, and he said, "Oh well, you can come along." So I went along there. I had to pay, mind you, but it's, it's not not free. Um, and while I was there, I raised this issue of the well. First of all, I raised the issue of the of the the inadequacy and the errors in the ICRP risk model, you know, which was embarrassing everybody, of course. And I and I got the microphone and I put my hand up in some plenary session and I and I got up and I said, well, the ICRP model we all know now is is wrong for internal radionuclides and people should study internal radionuclides and particularly ones that bind to DNA. And isn't it astonishing that nobody has actually measured the affinity constant of strontium ninety for DNA? Blah blah blah. Anyway, I'm saying all this stuff. And the chair at that time was a woman called Cisco Salomar. She's a big cheese in, in, in radiation protection in Europe. And I, I mean, I would say one of the nukes, if you'd like to put it like that. She's a, the, the head of STUK, which is the Radiation Protection Authority in Finland, who are quite big in this area of control. Yeah. And so she said, give me the microphone. And I said, no. <laughs> so, I, so I'm sort of spouting on about how all this stuff is killing everybody. And she's running up, up, the, up the aisle towards me to take the microphone. And so I'm running away from her. It's a big red carpeted aisle, so I'm shooting up that as she's coming off. And they're videoing all this crap, of course. <laughs> I mean, you never see the video. But, uh, but yeah, no, so that was quite an interesting, interesting time. And while I was there, incidentally, I met this gorgeous woman called uh, Kanu, Gusava Kanu, Irina Gusava Kanu. She said she was having difficulty getting her research uh, published on, on the effects of uranium because she she was she'd done a PhD and she'd studied the uranium workers in, in Arriva you know the, the, the French right. uranium workers the people who made all the uranium pellets for the nuclear reactors and so forth and she'd found that they had increased excess risks of all sorts of diseases but particularly lymph lymphoma and leukemia and the doses were really quite modest, you know. They were like sort of low, lowish doses, 20 millisieverts, less than 20 millisieverts, because that's the law. They can't have more than that. So that immediately defined a, a, an error in the risk uh, of, of about a thousand to two thousand times. So she said, "Well, she can't get this published. So she, could she could she put me down as a referee?" So I said, "Yeah, okay, sure." So anyway, the, the, she eventually she did get it published, and she got it published in a sl slightly diluted form with with a number of people from the uh, French IRSN. And it showed that the, that they were these uranium effects that nobody could explain. Uh, and then more recently, like this year, because I heard no more about the measurement of uranium and, uh, and, all, and research into internal radionuclides, but this year, in I think March of 2015, somebody sent me a document which was uh, um, the launch of what's called the, the Concerted Uranium Research Europe, which is an enormously expensive combined study of the health effects of internal radionuclides uh, focusing on uranium. See? So hurrah. So actually sometimes, so at last they've got off their asses. And, and the interesting thing, the people that have got off their asses to do this, because it's being led by the French Nuclear uh, um, Risk Agency, IRSN. So I think basically these people, I don't know what it is, but I think they're real scientists, you know. The, the French have always led the world in terms of philosophy and philosoph philosophical breakthroughs. Because yeah. they, and I think it's partly to do with the language, uh, and it's partly to do with the fact that they think they're so clever. Uh, and they are clever, you know, so that makes them extremely arrogant. And, and, and in their arrogance, they feel they can stand up to anybody, including their own nuclear industry. And I think that's kind of what they're doing. So I'm having a good laugh about all of this. Uh, uh, not, I've taken pops at the IRSM, but um, I think uh, Timothy Masso does much better studies, uh, you know, on animal wildlife. But I have to say that uh, they do seem to be quite decent, uh, as a, you know, generally, you know, and they're fighting uh, with the ICRP model. Um, yeah, I think they are. I, in fact, I did talk to somebody there, you know, and he said, you know, it, between you, I said, because I said, why are you doing all this? And he said, well, you know, we all know that the ICRP model is now dodgy, you know, and we've got to somehow get it out, get sure. get it out, and that's what this operation is, and it will take a while, but um, but that's what it is. Anyway, I didn't really believe him, but it does seem as if it maybe I mean, he was right, you know. This was who was this guy? Right? Was some guy from Sweden, yeah. Yeah, the, the uranium topic really, you know, when we're looking at it, the, in terms of dose, it's quite low. You know, if you have a Geiger counter, you know, uranium isn't going to, 
unless you get really up close to a large lump of it, uh, you're not really going to get much out of your Geiger counter. But that's uh, my whole I, point, Sean, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. my whole point. And I, I was just wondering, with, like with this study with Melody, you know, we, we're, we're talking about the nuclear industry, but, but we've also got it in uh, fertilizer. They use very cheap uranic fertilizer for tobacco. From, so for well, all fertilizer, all fertilizer contains uranium. I mean, well, sure. not all of it, but 95% of it contains uranium. Some of it's uranium. quite nasty and uh, it's got quite a lot of it, you know, and it gets taken up into certain plants. So yeah. it's, it's not necessarily the best uh, plant for tobacco. No, well, I mean, I have got, I'll, I'll give you an angle on that. And the angle is this, that the if you look at the ICRP risk model for uranium inhaled and uranium ingested, uh, and, and I think this is probably accurate because what they do is they feed it to animals and they see how long it how much of it gets into the system by inhalation you know or, or rather by ingestion and then also they let them inhale it and see how, how long it you know and all that stuff they do a lot of research on that so i think those biophysical and biochemical results are probably fairly accurate so if you look at the icrp risk model for in inhalation and and, and for um, ingestion the, the difference between them is about 600 times so in other words if you ingest one becquerel of of uranium or you inhale one becquerel of uranium the dose from the inhaled one becquerel is 600 times higher than the dose from the ingested uh, one so i don't think that the 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 danger from although it exists the danger from the fertilizer is anything like the danger from from the inhalation see the problem is the particles what the, the thing is on it, it throughout evolution uh systems developed to exclude dangerous substances from through from, but you know from, from passing through the gut so the gut has actual positive exclusion mechanisms and in fact plants do as well so there's been research done in germany by, by Sh my, my colleague schnug uh looking at the at the concentrate at the ability of plants to concentrate radionuclides from the soil and he's found no plants at all zero plants that will will take up uranium and the french have shown irsn research has shown uh, that the, the the plants have root hairs um, which take up water and these have a concentration um, limiting effect on uranium so uranium is excluded from plants you see and the same thing with human beings so we, we're perfectly we've developed through evolutionary time scales to exclude uranium through the diet and of course there would have been no reason to exclude uranium through inhalation because uranium doesn't exist in nature in any form that you can inhale it it's only when you pull it out of the ground and, and, and extract it and take the ore and dissolve it in acid and all that stuff you know and end up with the pure stuff and start shooting it around the place or blowing up bombs made of it that suddenly on earth you get all these particles of uranium that never existed before and then you inhale them and they go straight into the system and you've got 600 times the risk according to the icrp model never mind about the real model where you consider it binds to dna and all that stuff that's really quite but, interesting chris because um, if, if you, for example, take, for example, homeopathic medicine and um, when people who work and administer homeopathic medicines, they, 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 they give folk medicines in very, very small, minute quantities because the smaller and more minute quantities are, the easier they find it to penetrate the, the cells. So it, that, that's really, really quite significant what you just started saying there. Well, it's it's only what the ICRP model says, you know. I mean, so, but my point is that in the past, people have studied uranium with, uh, on the basis of its absorption through the gut. And so the results have not shown that there's any major, major problem. But if you start looking at the inhalation of the stuff, then it, then it's a different matter. You know? And, and, and inhal, inhale, it, uranium for, for inhalation has really only started in, in human, you know, in, in evolutionary terms in 1945 with Hiroshima. That was the first time they blew up a bomb made of uranium. And since then, they've blown up loads of bombs made of uranium. And each time they blow it up, it, it, it produces lots and lots of these nanoparticles that then float about the place and are available for inhalation. Um, just out of the in interest, Chris, now we're talking about this, we, we, we'd come back to the situ uh, situation in Fukushima. Um, would you say that uranium might be one of the isotopes that's been very uh, overlooked? I mean, I think absolutely. We measured it. We measured it. Yeah. I mean, I measured well, a lot of that work. I did, you know, measuring air filters and so forth. Uh, we 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 put that through um, gamma spectroscopy, and we found the uranium high levels of uranium two three five. You know, which is the enriched, you know, the the, the light sure. element, the one in the nuclear bombs. That that's turned quite, up quite in low large quantities in all the air filters. Right, and that's quite. And, and so, so basically, that's still a bit of an issue as far as, especially when they're working on the uh, the, the, the actual station. That uh, say number one, they were getting little spikes. Um, well, there'd be a lot of contamination from uranium around there for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. especially since 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 the thing blew up and all sorts of bits 
of uranium flew up in the air and landed down on the ground, you know? Fuel rods. Yeah. So, so I mean that, but but there, that obviously went uh, possibly north. It depends. There was a couple of different plumes that came out of Fukushima, so it's hard to work out which one. Well, all of that area, even down in Tokyo. I mean, that that filter that I did in that woman's um, apartment in Tokyo had 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 huge amounts. It had about I think it had about three thousand becquerels per kilogram of uranium two three five. Right, and there was an actual plume that came out along the coast going south and it swung out and then came back in and I think it came in sort of kind of from the, the, uh, the, the, the sort of the east and then coming yeah, up. Yeah, it went out. That's right. We, we plotted it all using the NOAA high split cal uh, calculation program and yeah, it went, it went out over the sea and then it turned around and came tracked back over Tokyo. So there was there's a couple of different plumes going on. There was the one that went northwest in towards Fukushima City as well. So, uh, but well, that but one it, went up to Iwate. Went up that, that went up that um, that valley. Didn't so it? in in terms of where they're measuring cesium and they're ignoring uranium and they're getting evacuees to move back to places that, as I, the, the the town that I mentioned at the start of the show. Um, and they're actually cutting their benefits, so they have to move back. Um, so it, they'll be going back to places that have been cleaned, but up the hill a little bit is, is as contaminated as it was, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, after the accident. Well, the thing is, Sean, it's not at all clear that, that you can say that where the high levels of cesium are will also be the high levels of uranium, because right. these things behave, they don't behave in the same way. See, cesium is quite soluble. Uranium is totally insoluble. And of course, it condenses at a different temperature. So if you get very high temperature, the condensation of uranium will occur long before the condensation of cesium. Because cesium, no. the, the, the melting so point. So maybe, is... maybe it snowed afterwards, I believe. So it, it may be a case that where it snowed, that's that would be where it'd be more probably up in the mountains where it would be. Well, I, I would think that I would think people ought to go and look. You know, it's not difficult. People can measure uranium. You just dig it out of the ground, and you can you know dig out, take your samples and, and measure it with uh, ICPM. Or, or, the, the, or, um, they, they don't. They don't allow people to take in Geiger counters or anything. Uh, no, I, I mean they should do that. It's not my point. Is I don't. I don't imagine yeah. the poor old people themselves to do it. You know, because you require some quite complicated, sophisticated, expensive gear to look for uranium. Right. But but the point is, it exists. I mean, that it's not. They will have these machines all over Japan, so it's just a question of sp spending a bit of money digging the samples up and then looking to see where the uranium is. Yeah. What, what, that's what, that's the problem with nuclear sites generally. They don't look for uranium. I mean, in England, which, where they do an enormous amount of testing of food and, and, and environment and sediment and seawater and you name it around nuclear sites. Every year, there's this big fat report, Radiation in Food and Environment, RIFE. Uh, but, it, but in none of the, hardly any measurements are made of uranium. The only, the only place Places that they measure uranium is around the uranium facility at Springfield in Capenhurst, and for the rest of it, you'll get you'll get measurements of europium and you know stuff that nobody ever cares about or hears about or probably you know doesn't even represent much of a hazard. And you'll get like they'll measure point naught 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 one of a becquerel of europium in in fish or something, and you think, well, you know, but what about uranium? Because that's what that's what these nuclear power stations run on, you know. So why don't we see that? But they never see it. They don't measure it. Well, coming up, as as Japan is obviously starting, well, trying to start up. It's been delayed again to the 11th of April this time. Um, but uh, they're trying to start up a reactor, and uh, of course, uh, we've been seeing very low levels of uh, radiation, 0.03 microsieverts per hour, really low sort of levels uh, since they closed their radiation in certain parts of uh, Japan. And uh, what, what we're going to be seeing, they're going to be starting them up again. And uh, and of course, as we were talking about, you know, as part of the normal running of a nuclear power station, they do gas releases, off gassing and what have you, uh, for refueling and uh, any other problems that, or, or whatever the you know, tests they're doing. Um, so basically, they do these off gas things, uh, they uh, travel around. And um, I, I think you've been involved with a study uh, on breast cancer. Uh, specifically, and uh, would, would you like to kind of update us, or unless you've got something else? Well, to say I did. On, I did three. I did three studies of nuclear sites, um, uh -huh. which all show breast cancer. But the, the the one that I presented at the inter at the world. Uh, conference on breast cancer in Birmingham uh, last week. Uh, it, it, it argued that the breast cancer epidemic, which started in 2000, in 19, about 1980, um, 
uh, was a, a result of the exposure to the nuclear weapons fallout. Now, if you look at the American rates, the SEER rates, the, the, there was a sudden increase in breast cancer incidence in the United States uh, in, in the official data, starting about 1982. It went up by 40%, and then it sat there, and, and then it went up a bit more, and then it started to come down. So there was this sudden increase in breast cancer, and you have to say, well, you know, since cancer is caused by some kind of environmental mutagen, about 20 to 15 years before the, the, the increase and before the clinical expression, we need to look for some environmental mutagen that suddenly entered the world environment around about 1960. And of course, there is only one. It's the atmospheric nuclear testing, which caused massive increases in radiation between the 1959 and 1963, when Kennedy and Khrushchev uh, banned atmospheric testing. Um, so that's the first thing. But what I did long ago, this was... Um, was I, I looked at the cohorts who were exposed in England and Wales. Because in, Engl in England, if you look at England and Wales, you have a very interesting laboratory. You have, you have two areas which are differentially contaminated with fallout. Because of all the rain in Wales, the measurements of, 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 of fallout in Wales, strontium-90 and cesium-137, showed that there was about two to three times the, the, the precipitation of these radionuclides in Wales than there was in England. And you've also got good cancer registries in Wales and England, which, which, which operated from 1974. And also you, you've got the mortality data that goes right back to 1935, the, the, the registrar general figures. So I, got, I dug all this stuff out and I did an enormous amount of work. This took, I don't know, six months. I wrote to my poor wife when I was still living with her because she's a mathematician. She did a lot of this work. It's just a lot of tedious number crunching. You have to get the populations and work out the rates and so forth. And when you do this, what you find is what you expect. Because what, 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 what the Japanese data shows us is that if you take an, a, an acute exposure, the... Um, the, 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 the group of people who are most likely, you know, who are most at risk, who have the highest sensitivity to radiation, are the women aged 12 to 15. These are women whose breasts are forming at that time, okay? So in other words, as the cells forming the breasts start to replicate, those cells are much more um, sensitive to radiation, like all, all, all replicating cells are much more sensitive to radiation by about a hundred times. So those are the people who are most likely to be affected. And so what you need to do is follow that group of women. That's women who were aged four to, uh, 12 to 15 in 1959 to 1963. That's quite a specific cohort of women. And you can look to see, as they get older, what their breast cancer rates are compared to women of the same ages who were, who were born before that or after that, see? Uh, you can follow them through time. And we did this. We did this. We did this up to about 1996 or something. And you could continue to do it, but I think the more recent data would be, be um, more difficult to interpret because they have all sorts of drugs now which, which, which stop you from dying. And they have all sorts of um, drugs which, which, which alter the rate at which you, the breast cancer progresses. And also there, there have been changes in the diagnosis using all these x-ray people that go around the place x-raying everybody, you know. So, so I think what we did was reasonable. And what it showed is that these women who are going through puberty at the time of the fallout have much, much higher risk of breast cancer than, than women either side of them. And since these women are now getting older, they're now in the sort of 50 to 55 to 60 age group, they're the ones who are driving the breast cancer uh, excess. This was the paper that I gave anyway. Um, and the other thing about it is, is what? Is that the, oh yes, is that the rate increased, as I said, you know, in America it started in 1982. In, in Britain and Wales, it started in Wales in 1979. So in other words, the increase started earlier in Wales. So you can put the two graphs together, which I, I, I've, I've done this in Wings of Death, I think, um, in 1995. If you put the, the incidence rate graph alongside the incidence rate graph for Wales, uh, that's the English one and the Welsh one, you find that the two were more or less the same for a long period of time. So Wales was slightly higher than England. So if you say that the, the mean rate in 1979 can be determined as, as a, an index of 100, then in 19, between 1974 and 79, it was 100 in England, and it was roughly 105 in Wales. But then uh, as soon as it got to 79, what happened is it increased in Wales. So it went up in Wales, but it stayed the same in England, see? Now, you would expect this, because from the from the, the, the data from Hiroshima, we know that the higher the dose, the earlier the 
increase in, in in breast cancer. So in other words, you know, the time lag between dose and expression, between dose and clinical um, expression, is shorter if the dose is higher, which, which is which is you know quite reasonable because it just means more cells so, so are being damaged. What was the source of that particular uh, uh, spike in in uh, radiation? That was the fallout. That was, was that just the fallout, and we got that before? Uh, well, why would we get we, we got that earlier? Did we then? Uh... No, no, you didn't get it earlier. You got the same in Wales, but you got oh. more dose in Wales. You see, so in oh, other words, oh. because it was more dose, the onset of the increase was earlier. Right. Okay. And of That's course, would, would Ireland have been worse still? Do you think? Depends on rainfall. Bad on the west coast, and, and not so bad on the east coast. But the problem with Ireland is the east coast is is, is uh, most of the people live close to the Irish Sea, and they have effects from Sellafield. So, um, but of course that's true in Wales. That's true in Wales as well. So I mean, probably you would have found that in Ireland too. Yeah. So wherever wherever it's rainy, you get much higher fallout. So if you compared the west coast with the east coast, you'd have more breast cancer on the west coast than on the east coast, sure. and it would start, and the and the and the effect would start earlier. But uh, unfortunately, you'd never find out because they didn't have a cancer registry in uh, in Ireland until until 1994. Well, I've, I actually have friends up in the hills of Leitrim. I think I've, I've told you about these uh, these people, Sean, a few times, and they're very, very well aware of the fallout that, that hit Leitrim up in the hills there in the northwest of Ireland. Up, you know, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, and they say even to this day, do not drink the water. <laughs> Just be very, very careful with the water that's coming off the hills. Yes, yes, they will have got something from Chernobyl too, probably. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, so rainfall, you see, I mean, that that's the point. I mean, all these arguments about breast cancer have been, I mean, lot, you know, the, the nukes, they, they blame the chemicals. So a lot of people blame the chemicals. I mean, a lot of research done on agrochemicals. But if you look at the rates in the eastern part of England, where they, where they have agriculture, and you have lots of agrochemicals and pesticides and all those things, um, the actual rates of breast cancer are much, much lower. They're highest in the areas of high rainfall, which is like the west of Scotland and, and Wales and Cumbria, of course. But then, you know, Cumbria is anomalous because you've got Celebi. So that's uh, something else. So, so, this, so this is, uh, all, this is could, could we surmise then that, that this is mainly coming from atmospheric fallout then? Yeah, is it right. Is this continual? Is this... Well, is the, the, those big explosions, yes, that's right, it is. It, it, they blasted the um, this material into the stratosphere and it's been coming down slowly ever since. Okay. And there's still a lot of it up there and it still comes down. So you still find it in the rainfall and you still find it in the ground. And you'll find, you know, yeah. precipitation from fallout still now. And, it, uh, you know, this is like, what, 60, 70, 90, 40 years. So, like, the half-lives of these, of the main nuclides, strontium and, and cesium, about 30 years. So it will be physically decaying. But, but, and a lot of it will have precipitated, but, but uh, a lot of it won't have. A lot of it's still there and still that's, coming down. That's yeah, quite I guess amazing. in the milk. So how, how long are we looking at before it eventually all comes down? Oh, I think... Um, Maybe a hundred years, really. Right. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's that's crazy. So, I mean, in uh, sort of Japan, basically, if we can uh, go back to there, maybe finish off there. I mean, Chris, have you got um, sort of any any thoughts on on what's happening over there? Just well, generally. No, I mean, I, we don't know what's going on there. I mean, what 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 is very worrying is that they haven't they haven't actually got got those reactors under control. So that's still polluting the Pacific, you know, and that's going to go on and on and on. And of course, they're, they're doing, uh, you know, the, the concentrations are not very great, but they do affect they do affect the the, the larval stages of development of the of, of all of these um, creatures in you know invertebrates and vertebrates as well as uh, and 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 that's going to affect the food chains in in the Pacific, yeah. you know, and it will have a I could have a very serious effect on on. Uh, is is uh, is that biota. is that where the genetic binding to the DNA kicks into action then? Because I'm uh, I'm trying to get my head around how uh, this uranium genetically binds. No, well, there are two there are two there are two ways in which it it works. But yes, you're right. The first the first way is it causes defects in the develop uh, in the in the developmental stages. You know, so like the pre developmental stages. So in other words, it's a true genetic effect or a genomic effect. So in other words, the children are not born because they can't develop. That's the first thing. But the second thing is that there are somatic effects. So in other words, if it binds to cells in the organism, then the cells themselves will be destroyed and some of them will, will go on to become cancerous. So both of those things will occur. But in terms of the, of the, the problem of, of biota in the Pacific, it will be the first of those that's the problem. It won't be the cancer effects in adult form, life forms. It will be the genet genetic effects in the developmental uh, stages. Um, you know, right. And, and that, that, could, that could be quite serious. And maybe that is possible. 
part of what's happening already, because I think there have already been reports that there are massive reductions in all sorts of species in, in the Pacific. Yeah, massive. It's almost, it, it's hard to keep up with the numbers coming in on a daily basis these days, I think. Uh, uh, especially salmon, I well, think, this, is this, the latest This is one. why I wrote this Hiroshima article, incidentally, because these, these are going to feed through to resource wars, you know. People are going to starve. The people who have relied upon the Pacific for their food are no longer going to be able to rely upon the Pacific for their food, in which case they won't be able to go fishing and sell their fish, so they will starve. And the people won't have fish to eat, so they will starve. And so it will go on from there. So eventually what happens when people are in those situations is they go to war with their neighbor in order to take what their neighbor's got hmm. or to make themselves powerful, you see. And then nowadays, of course, you know, that's done through the medium of, of nuclear war. And of course, the generals and the Dr. Strangelove characters will say, hey, wow, you know, all we've got to do is blow everyone to pieces and, you know, sit underground for a long time. Then we'll pop up and then, you know, somehow there'll be enough food for all of us. But actually, no. Uh, it's crazy, uh, crazy ideas with all the nuclear weapons that are around at the moment. Well, 15,000. Um, they're 15,000. You've got to recall that the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, which totally flattened the city. You know, you've got all the, seen all the pictures, mm. all the dreadful destruction. That was 13 kilotons, okay? Now, the mean size of a modern nuclear weapon is 800 kilotons, and there's 15,000 of them. Yeah, it's crazy. That is bad. So, I mean, all right. Any okay. one of those, any one of those would wipe out a major city. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was, I, I was actually having a little bit of a mess around. Uh, I think uh, Libby Halevi may have uh, posted uh, a little bit of a. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a little of a, an application where you can sort of detonate a bomb in your in your favourite local city, and you can sort of like see the results. And it's quite amazing what some of those bombs will she, do. She, she recommends everybody ticks the body count uh, uh, on it. You know, right? Well, there's. Yeah. A, I mean, I've got a book. It's really you, anyone can buy it. There's probably a few of them around. It's called The Effects of Nuclear Weapons by Samuel Glaston, and it was first published in 1957. The more recent versions of it sort of 1970 versions of it, have got a little calculator in the back, like those calculators that you use, look like a little disc where you twirl things around and the little windows. Yeah. Right. And uh, it's, it's called the, it's called, I think it's called the Atomic Bomb uh, Effect Calculator. It was developed by the, by the, um, those people at Albuquerque, New Mexico, Lovelace, the Lovelace Institute. It's a beautiful little thing, all different colors. And it will tell you how to, uh, you know, it will tell you how many buildings will be destroyed, the size of the crater, how many dead people, all of this stuff, you know, you just dial in the bomb size and off you go. Yeah, well, let's hope they, they never come to using them again. Uh, we've certainly uh, spent I think a lot it's of a, I think it's a joke. I think it's an attempt for the... It's quite psychologically interesting, you know. It's an attempt by the physicists to imagine that they have control of the situation. They can sit there, twiddle this thing, and think, oh, yes, right, you know, put in 800 kilotons, and what do you get? And, and you know, and they're going to be sitting there in their bunker, and they're just going to vanish. They'll just be vaporized, you know, with their calculator. <laughs> well, they, they, was, they were saying it would take about uh, just a, a small exchange between Pakistan and India, for instance, um, to basically cause a total global uh, sort of collapse in the weather system. Um, as we seem to be going through a, a, a global collapse in the weather system, I don't think it would be uh, it would take that much more, you know, than a you know sort of a few dozen bombs. Oh well, that's the that's, that's the Sagan thing. That's the nu nuclear winter stuff, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I mean, we had a mini nuclear winter in between 1959 and 63. I mean, I was there, you know. I can remember how cold it was. It was bloody freezing, I can tell you, you know. And there, there was increase in infant mortality and all sorts, you know. There was fog, there was snow. It was like, I, I remember freezing, my ass freezing to the seat of my Triumph Bonneville. In 1962. <laughs> was, was that from atmospheric testing? Or? Yeah, it was, yeah. Right. Sure. That was from the nuclear testing in, in, in Kazakhstan, mainly, the Russians. Yeah. It's quite anyway, poignant, um, quite I, poignant I think really, it, Sean, really, on this. Uh, we're, we're on the anniversary week of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, really, to be having this conversation. Brilliant. Uh, a little reminder for people. Couple, couple of lot of places. You know, I, I think as our, one of our guests said there quite recently, uh, all nuclear is local to everybody, so... Uh, there's no such thing as a, a nuclear accident or a nuclear explosion happening just somewhere across the other side of the planet because I think at this stage we can be assured it affects each and every one of us. Yeah, that's for sure. I, I would sort of draw people, uh, draw you know, uh, to people the attention that during the Canadian wildfires we interviewed, or just after we interviewed uh, Candice Paul, 
Um, it's on one of our podcasts, and uh, she one of the little problems she picked up on. Uh, we were talking about the plumes, and uh, they probably were making it to Europe. And uh, she she mentioned that in that area where all the fires were, there's lots of uranium mining, and uh, basically there's lots of uranium spill off and uh, pollution around there, um, and uh, a lot of it went into the waterways, and it's uh, gone into the trees, and uh, oh, the trees caught fire. Um, so while we were looking and worrying about Chernobyl's multiple fires this year, uh, we have uh, would just recommend you go over and have a listen to Candy's Paul talking about that and also the ecological uh, and social impacts uh, for the tr- uh, Dene tribe in, in Canada. So, uh, but yeah, um, all right, Chris, I, I think we're going to have to finish off on that note. Uh, a little sure, plug okay. for, and and I know that is there anything else just to uh, you know sort of finalise this you know what you're up to any updates that you'd like to sort of make, talk to us about or anything you'd like well, to say? Well, there are various things. I mean, the, the the main one is the court case in the Royal Courts of Justice, sure. um, which 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 was quite successful. I went and I don't know have I, have I talked to you about this? I don't think so. The latest one, I, I I I went before the judge. We had a really we're in a really posh court. This is the court of the law of the of the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. So they obviously think that we're worth it. Um, this is court number four in the Royal Courts of Justice. And uh, the, the judge threw out the application by Hogan Lovells not to have any more expert witnesses. So I managed to, I, I'm going to bring in some expert witnesses myself. Excellent. I'm now the Excellent. representative in that case. And I shall get to, and the expert witnesses coming in on behalf of the Ministry of Defence uh, include uh, that beautiful lady, Geraldine Thomas, who I yep. will be able to interrogate in the witness box. So that should be quite interesting. Oh, that's brilliant, because you, you were a little bit, uh, you were a little bit down high. I think the last time you were on the show because it wasn't going quite well at the time and you were of a mind of just giving up I think you I think you were on the verge of giving up so that's a little bit of good news on that front I think well yes yeah I mean I still don't know whether they're going to find me all that money they haven't written back about that one but uh, but anyway right. as far as the case it's the substantive case is concerned that does seem to be on 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 going uh, but it's not going to be heard until June 2016 so you know usual thing probably everybody will be dead by then let's hope I'm still alive <laughs> We'll all, be pray- we'll all be praying for you, Chris. You know, you're, you're, you've been so active. I mean, if anybody listens to this interview, they can see that you've been doing so many different things, uh, so involved in so many different areas. And, you know, uh, as we're seeing from the melody, uh, the new melody sort of uh, study on uranium uh, uh, effect and other effects of internal uh, radionuclides that, that, that you've obviously been doing something and you you know you've been accomplishing things well that so, does like, seem to yeah I'm quite I'm quite sort of encouraged by that I have to say yeah, yeah. Sure. Now, you, this, you, you're really shining at the moment Chris well done my friend uh, I'm, I'm stunned as an activist I just feel like I'm not doing a lot at all when I even just listen to a bit, uh, uh, an hour of what you've been up to and it's been a pleasure as well by the way Chris <laughs> ok fingers crossed that I remain alive that's the main thing you know that's ahead of the game at my age. <laughs> uh, well, we don't want to have that breaking exclusive. We'd rather have this type of one. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, right. okay. Anyway, Thanks. listen, I'm, I'm going to Korea um, for a court case. Uh, when right. is it? On the 20th or so, you know? And they're flying me out on some airline I've never even heard of. So, I mean, my mate was saying to me, you'll get on the plane and you'll be the only person there except for this black thing that's ticking. You know? <laughs> it's, not, it's not Malaysian <laughs> Airlines, is it? Let's hope not. Have you ever heard that? No. Nah. I don't think it exists. I think they must have invented it for me. <laughs> Probably an expedition or something. Expedition flight. You'd be landing yeah. in Shannon. Look on the bright side. <laughs> in an orange suit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take care, Chris. Um, uh, yeah, anything you want to say, Jimmy, just to finish? Ah, uh, no, just uh, thanks very much, Chris, for coming in and giving us that little update. That was brilliant, and I'm just delighted now that you're making a, a little bit of progress with the Test Veterans case. And I think you yeah, know that. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. yeah, glad to hear that. All right, God bless. Take care. Okay. We'll see you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye, chaps. Okay. Okay. Business, business.